I just wanted to start with a little tiny little anecdote. 24 years ago, uh, 1988, I, um, uh, that was the last uh, Georgetown Symposium I attended. <laughs> um, um, and I was, uh, I was a, a presenter at that point, and I had a paper. And this, of course, 1988, March 1988, it was um, just um, when the Antifada had started in Palestine. And uh, uh, I remember coming here, and the session was started a little bit late, because these sessions tend to start a little bit late. Um, and, uh, and so, and I started my comment by saying, you know, it is now, it was 11 o'clock, uh, or 10 past 11, and I said, it's now 12 o'clock. So everybody looked at the watch and thought, this guy's gone mad. Um, I was only trying to make the point that in Palestine, um, they had put um, their clocks an hour forward in order to be different from Israel, you know, and to reflect uh, daylight saving time. Um, I'm only saying it because the, the moment in Palestine, um, back 24 years ago, uh, where people uh, threw off this, uh, uh, this fear uh, and this uh, sense of being uh, dominated in all aspects of their lives. Um, this moment has, is repeating itself now throughout the Middle East and North Africa and even some places further afield. Um, and, uh, the, um, and, and where are, you know, there are huge differences between countries. Certainly Palestine is a military occupation, uh, countries with repressive regimes. Um, the, uh, but but the, the, the common element is very much the psychology of people um, not uh, being afraid anymore, for a time anyway, um, having a sense that they uh, have their destiny in their own hands. Um, and that's extremely empowering, of course, uh, and extremely hope-giving. And even though these things may uh, water out or be defeated even, uh, we'll have to see what happens in Syria, of course, um, the revolutions are far from completed in, in Egypt and Yemen and, and other places, so uh, we, we don't know what the end result will be. But, but that psychological moment is of, is of critical importance and it, it means that an important chapter was, was turned regardless of what, what happens uh, with, with um, the, the, new, the old regimes and the new regimes. Well, uh, this panel is on the, on the Gulf mostly, uh, and Syria, uh, and, um, and Yemen, which is not the Gulf, I suppose, but uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Arabian Peninsula. And the key, the key uh, factor combining these, these places is Saudi Arabia. Um, and I hope that, that I know that, uh, that uh, Professor Nonneman will, will address Saudi Arabia directly, but I hope that also the other two panelists will, in their presentations on their countries, uh, will have maybe just a couple of comments about Saudi Arabia at least, because I think it's really very important to understand what Saudi Arabia's role has been uh, in the, in the um, uh, Arab Spring, uh, from you know, the fall of uh, Hosni Mubarak to uh, supporting the uh, Bahraini regime, to supporting uh, possibly with arms the uh, Syrian uh, opposition. Um, so that, that's, you know, everybody has been caught into all kinds of very interesting contradictions. We love that as academics. Uh, and, uh, and I think we have three excellent panelists here to, uh, to uh, take that apart and to show us exactly what's been going on. And uh, if you look at your program, we'll take it down from the, from the top down. So uh, the first, we have three speakers. One is uh, Dr. Stacy Philbrick Yadav from Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Then uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Bassam Haddad, uh, previously of Georgetown University, now with George Mason University. And finally, we have a professor, and I asked him how he wanted his name pronounced. Of course, uh, it's Gert or Gert. Um, he, he settles for Gert, but you can call him Gert. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> Nonneman, uh, who is uh, back at Georgetown University, but in Qatar. Uh, 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 and uh, we uh, are going to uh, start with, um, with uh, Stacy, who is giving a paper uh, called This Unity and Difference, Opposition Responses to the GCC Process in Yemen. I think she's going to look especially at the question of the uh, cleavage between the, the, pro the street protesters and the organized uh, opposition. Uh, the floor is yours, 20 minutes, thank you. Okay, uh, so first of course I want to thank the organizers and, and say how much I've enjoyed being here. And one of the things that I've been particularly struck by are some rather unexpected points of convergence between these, uh, the disparate kind of detailed histories that we've been seeing. And in particular, how many of the stories start much earlier than 2011. So 2011 and 2012 have been a powerful time for thinking about the concept of solidarity. And I want to frame my discussion today around 
events in Yemen that have challenged flattening notions of sameness or aggregation that are associated with the idea of unity and instead have reaffirmed notions of solidarity and difference. So political theorist Iris Marion Young noted in her last book, The Responsibility for Justice, that solidarity is a relationship among separate and dissimilar actors who decide to stand together and for one another. We get many of our formative political lessons, I think, from pop culture. So as a child of stadium rock anthems, I think my own thinking uh, about solidarity was probably shaped by you too, and the idea that we are one, but we're not the same, yet we get to carry each other. It's this idea of carrying each other or deciding affirmatively to stand for one another that suggests that responsibilities taken up through acts of solidarity are not in tension with the existence of difference, but instead that the existence of difference may it be at least in part constitutive of solidarity. The Yemeni revolutionary movement has been replete with examples of this kind of solidarity and difference. And recognizing this, I think, is an essential counter to policy discourses that characterize Yemen as having perhaps the region's most uniquely fractured political landscape. How often have we been told that Yemen is deeply divided? And how often has that been a precursor to a shrugging of shoulders and a call for a strong central state? I'll argue today that identifying acts of deciding to stand with differently situated others can help us to understand at least three distinct features of the Yemeni revolutionary movement. First, it can help us to understand where the, Yem the Yemeni revolutionary movement came from, and I echo here Lisa's observation yesterday that it wasn't really all that surprising in Yemen. Um, and I'll talk about some of the solidarities that formed in the 2000s and served as the antecedents of the revolution. Second, a focus on solidarity and difference can also help to explain how a decentralized and in some cases anti-centralized movement has managed to sustain collective action against prodigious challenges from domestic and external actors. And it's worth remembering that there are tens of thousands, sometimes close to 100,000 protesters who remain in the square today and very much view the revolution as unfinished. Lastly, a focus on the dynamic and practical dimensions of solidarity can help to raise serious questions about the approach currently being adopted by major international actors, including the Saudis, and some Yemenis uh, towards the national dialogue process, which is now sort of beginning to be underway. So first, what kind of solidarities and difference were built during and prior to, more importantly from my perspective, prior to the revolutionary movement? By February 2011, which is taken as the, rather, as the start date, um, it was clear that the Yemeni revolutionary movement would be articulated as a critique of both the regime and the formal partisan opposition. And that's, uh, I think, particularly significant. By opposition today, I'll be talking about the Joint Meeting Parties Alliance, an alliance that was by February 2011 nearly a decade old, depending on how one understands the alliance's origins. By February 2011, Yemenis had good reason to be critical of the JMP's inefficacy, its Sana'a centrism, and its increasingly ossified political leadership. But the post-partisan and in some ways anti-partisan tone of the revolutionary movement sometimes occluded the central role that was played by a subset of JMP members as antecedents to the revolution. The process of building and sustaining a cross-ideological cross -ideological cooperation, which is central to later revolutionary solidarities, is indebted to the politics of the JMP over the past decade, both inside the alliance itself and at its margins. So within the alliance itself, cooperation between the parties was cemented by mid-level partisan actors in their 30s and 40s who shared dense professional and educational networks, who interacted with each other informally and socially on a continual basis, and who did so particularly at moments of great policy tension between senior leaders in the parties. This cross-ideological cooperation was also strengthened by a formal commitment to power sharing between the parties, which amplified the voices of smaller actors in the service of trust building. And so senior Islahis viewed themselves as, um, as committing to formal power sharing as a means of constraining themselves, of putting up with less than they were owed in order to ensure the survival of the alliance. But more convincing than those commitments were the, the kinds of compromises that mid-level, Islahis in particular, that mid-level actors made, um, which are repeatedly mentioned by non-Islahis as have, demonstrating their commitment to cross-ideological cooperation. This articulation of commitment often happened at the margins of the alliance, 
through the work of mid-level partisans in their 30s and 40s who had other roles and jobs as well. Um, through these dense professional and educational ties to the associational sector, they were routinely in contact with activists in the independent media and human rights sector in particular. So these activists staged and made visible a kind of solidarity indifference, explicitly affirming each other's rights to divergent views on critical and substantive issues, but they also mapped out a space of convergence and staged an emerging consensus regarding the parameters of procedural reform. So for example, they emphasized devolution and some form, or some form of federalism um, and off offered nationalist justifications for affirming local particularities. They affirmed the necessity of equal protection for divergent views, particularly in debates about press freedom, but not exclusively so. There was also a rich and vibrant debate about creedal freedom um, that I was particularly interested in. So this process was reliant on a resilient, if imperiled, independent media, an independent media that came under increasing pressure and scrutiny uh, as the decade proceeded. And it required a, a kind of triangulation, a kind of intersectoral triangulation. So when media and rights activists faced pressure from the regime, the parties would rally to their support. When parties or individual partisans faced pressure, um, media and rights activists would rally to their support. And this, I think, was central to crafting what I've called post-partisan oppositional nationalism, a statist kind of bottom-up nationalism akin to what Mohammed Bamiya yesterday referred to as a notion of new patriotism that fed the revolutionary movement. More generally, I think that the picture that I've offered is consistent with what we know about the fluid and overlapping nature of social and political identities and their relationship to articulations of interest. So I recall here Americanist Roger Smith's call to shift from an analysis of so-called identity politics an approach which treats groups in this fractured political landscape as given um, to a politics of identity understood as the telling of persuasive stories, the act of engaging others in the making of social identity. So he says that senses of membership in a political community or a political people to which one is commonly understood to owe allegiance do not emerge semi-automatically from economic, demographic, sociological, geographic, linguistic, ancestral, biological, religious, or cultural characteristics. It's a very long list. Rather, drawing on and they are drawing on and constrained by such features of human life, elites and would-be elites craft many forms of political peoplehood through the telling of persuasive stories. This process of persuasive storytelling always occurs amid contestation and dispute, which makes the most persuasive stories those which can dynamically incorporate difference without effacing it. Those stories are continually reworked and reenacted in practice and the practical dimension of collective action, a process by which differently situated actors have inhabited common spaces and engaged in shared rituals matter vitally for the revolutionary identity articulation that's occurring in Yemen. Yemeni revolutionary movement and its rituals have relied on a notion of national belonging that has not effaced important differences, but has in fact often foreground them and made them visible through the organization of space. And I'll give a couple of examples in a minute. Revolutionaries have told a story that has emphasized belonging in difference, a version of Yemeniness that thrives on deliberation and does not require unanimity. This story relies on the previous work of JMP activists and their relationships to associational sector activists. And it's worth recalling that while February is the conventional start date for the revolution, it was in mid-January that these very same actors were organizing the pink protests. Um, the pink protests preceded the revolutionary movement and in fact the, the revolu revolutionary movement um, I think articulated itself as a critique of the inefficacy of the reform agenda of the, the JMP. Um, but it adopted idioms that had been rehearsed even weeks before by JMP partisans and their allies. Articulations of belonging and difference have been expressed by the revolutionary movement through a variety of practices, ranging from the spatial configuration of protest spaces in which dissimilar actors engaged in and have continued to engage in sustained political deliberation and coordinated in the provision of public goods, in the relationship between unarmed civilian groups and armed people protectors, so this could be, as in the case of Tha'iz, um, civilian protesters in, in a city core surrounded by tribal militias offering their, their protective support against the regime. This could be also women and children protesting with cadres of men kind of escorting them and forming a physical buffer between the regime's forces. 
also through explicit solidarity events, which borrowed the we are all rhetorics deployed throughout the region um, and explicitly named uh, the differently situated actors to whom one was owing solidarity. And the Life March in December and the Dignity March in January, which received nearly no mainstream media attention, each originated in a particular locality and expressed the specific grievances of that locality, but elicited material support and participation by people from other regions along the way, increasing the numbers by tens of thousands. Um, the estimates for the number of participants in the Life and Dignity Marches are various, and I can't begin to say what is the most reliable, but all accounts see a multiplication of participants as the march proceeded. I'd like to end by highlighting the ways in which I see the current planning and implementation of the national dialogue process as undermining the solidarity building that has taken place during the revolutionary period and prior to it um, through the reification on the part of planners of social and political identities. The GCC agreement, which was signed in November and later sanctified by UN Security Council Resolution 2014, reflected the dual desire of powerful international actors to work with known quantities on the one hand. On the other hand, it was also an effort to sidestep direct negotiations with groups that engaged in the use of physical force. This has had the unfortunate effect of amplifying the power of the Joint Meeting Parties Alliance or the formal partisan opposition at precisely that moment when its leadership was being called into account or called to account for its own inefficacy by the revolutionary movement. It provided, the GCC framework provided a powerful incentive to JMP leaders to enter into negotiations by offering them a secure position in the transitional government. It was resisted from the outset, more or less openly, depending on the groups in question, and it's mobilized nearly as much resistant activism, I think, as the regime itself. The GCC framework delivered Saleh's departure from power, but it also delivered an amnesty law and an uncontested election. So it's been a profound and deep disappointment. The next step in the GCC framework is the national dialogue, which is intended to be more inclusive than the GCC agreement itself had been, and that, if you've looked at the text of that agreement, was a two-party agreement between the JMP and the regime. So there's certainly an effort with the national dialogue to move beyond those na narrow parameters. But planning has relied on a rigid categorical approach to identity, very much at odds with the kind of solidarities that have been made possible through the revolution. As currently conceived by members of the UN team and the Friends of Yemen, as well as some senior Yemeni figures, each individual participant in the national dialogue fits neatly into a single categorical slot and only one. Representation will be guaranteed to former regime figures, opposition parties, Houthis, the Southern Movement, women's groups, and youth organizations, and they anticipate a total of about 240 participants. This is absolutely more inclusive than the two-party GCC agreement, but it's not even consistent with the expectations of Security Council Resolution 2014, which called for the immediate formation in November of an outreach committee to expand the scope of participation in the national dialogue process. That committee has yet to be formed. More significantly, it makes two unreasonable assumptions, unreasonable on theoretical grounds, but also in the face of the lived reality of the revolutionary movement for many of its participants. First, it assumes that people fit into only one category, which is patently unsustainable. And even a softer version of this, that individuals have primary identities and that these primary identities are fixed, is at odds with the storytelling approach that I think is more persuasive. The stories that are being told are shifting conceptions of right and obligation in ways that are, I think, critically important for the planners of the national dialogue to contend with. Second, it assumes that the interests of each actor, is, or each of the actors in the national dialogue would be given. Once we know what an individual's primary identity is, we know what he or she will want and what he or she will pursue within the context of the national dialogue. This reflects a gross failure of political imagination and one which fails to take account of the possibility that individuals could choose to stand with or for someone who is differently situated, as many have done for more than a year. This approach to planning the national dialogue is also at serious risk of being outpaced by events on the ground. So new political parties have formed even this week um, with membership that crosses previously established boundaries from the Ummah party to the Rashad Union to others that probably came up while I've been speaking. Um, new and unusual alliances have been forged as with the Southern Movement and the Houthis, right? So 
very dissimilarly situated groups um, and their recogni mutual recognition of each other's aspirations for territorial autonomy. So none of this can be easily accommodated by a flattening and reductive approach to the relationship between identity, interest, and solidarity as it's been adopted by planners of the national dialogue process. This is one of several reasons that I think the national dialogue itself is facing so much resistance and may even fail to go forward. And that failure would signify the broader poverty of the GCC framework. If it does go forward, there seems also to be significant risk that it will reproduce the very conditions that fueled some of the revolutionary movement to begin with by further entrenching positions of senior level elites within the opposition and minimizing the voice of those Yemenis within and outside of the partisan system who have the most experience of doing the quotidian work of what many of us would call nation building. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I uh, would like to, of course, speak about the uprising in Syria. I'm uh, talking about uh, a number of things today in a very succinct manner, so it will be a little bit crammed. I'll be discussing the dynamics of the uprising, uh, but in particular, uh, the principal structural cause, uh, the regime resilience and its limits, which is the title, and where is the uprising going, and uh, fin I'll finish with uh, a small, um, uh, a set of comments, uh, quick comments about the bottom line. The first thing I would like to start with, oh, first of all, thank you all for inviting uh, everyone. And this is, uh, of course, my home because I've been at Georgetown since I can uh, remember in one way or another. And it's really exciting to, uh, to be here uh, again and uh, in this, in this, um, in your com with your company here. First, I'd like to say that uh, in the case of Syria, after more than a year and more than 8,000 people killed uh, and the blackout that exists in terms of uh, media coverage, I would like to announce here that, uh, well, I'd like to announce the death of the role of the intellectual and the death of the role of analysis from the outside. I think it's very important for us to recognize the limits of what we can say and speculate on from the outside for various reasons. Without deep knowledge of what is happening on the ground, I think a lot of the analysis that we are making and we are producing has begun to hit serious diminishing returns. Which, uh, and I would not be able to add very much, uh, and I don't pretend to be adding very much at this point. We could the first six or seven or eight months of the uprising. So, uh, good thing I, I live in the area because I wasn't flown in and not much expenses were, were incurred to get me here. I'll start with two stubborn facts. Uh, as you probably know, there's a lot of confusion about the uprisings in Syria. Actually, the most confusion uh, relates to the case of Syria, which makes sense for many reasons, as I'll be discussing. But it really is not an impossible puzzle, and we will try to unpack it. There are two stubborn uh, facts that I will start with that animate the uprising. First, we are witnessing an opposition to decades of dictatorship in Syria. This fact cannot be compromised uh, at all. No matter how much we try to uh, spin things, no matter how much we try to talk about problematic external actors, and they exist, and they are infiltrating, and they have uh, things and re sorry, they have reasons to interfere in the Syrian situation that are not in the best interest of Syrians. We do know all that, but none of this can compromise the importance of uh, critiquing the opposition, uh, the critiquing the, the dictatorship, and opposing the dictatorship. No carte blanche is given to the dictatorship simply because the opposition has gotten to be extremely problematic and is serving interests that are not necessarily all Syrian. Second, which actually is the correlate, is that we can no longer take this uprising for granted. We are no longer witnessing a clear-cut event where a pro-democracy movement is facing a dictatorship. The dictatorship side is constant and stays, but we are no longer witnessing a pure pro-democratic uh, force as we have seen in the past. And this could be a function of the length of time it has taken so far. This has become a war of position in which the, opposition, uh, the opposition's moral high ground has diminished considerably. And we passed the point where the opposition can depend on the first point, which is that it's facing a vicious dictatorship for decades. Uh, can I grab my water? Yeah. Sorry. Having said that, um, the uh, complexity of the uprising, of course, uh, st stays with us. First, um, all the uprising are com uprisings are complex. Every time I talk about the complexity of the Syrian uprising, 
people tell me that, well, the Egyptian uprising is also complex and all the other ones are also complex, and that's evidently the case. However, the Syrian uprising has an added complexity because of its pivotal role in various historical struggles in the region. This explains the protracted nature of the uprising and the undeniable uh, or undesirable nature of all the alternatives. As I have said uh, before, and I will close with this as well, at some point we are no longer facing a situation where we're comparing the good options to the bad options. We are all actually facing a situation where we're comparing the horrible options to the catastrophic options. And I think if we are not realistic about this formula, and I could be a little bit, bit pessimistic, but not too much, if we're not realistic about this formula, I feel that we will keep aiming for the uh, optimal outcome and then we will encounter disaster. Instead, I think we should all be realistic and consider the suboptimal outcomes. A couple of points about the complexity of the uprising. First, uh, it's, first it's a, we have a local, regional, and international stalemate at this point and I will discuss uh, some of this as well. Uh, this is currently producing a renewed regional or strategic effort, sorry, it, it is producing a renewed strategic effort inside Syria on part of the opposition in a more militant and a more sectarian direction as we have been seeing after the uh, bombardment and destruction of Baba Amr. There's a regrouping of the opposition and it's definitely moving in directions that are different from what we have witnessed again, in more militant and more sectarian dimensions. We are likely to see different local opposition forces. The more radical Islamist brand will split off or become the core of the militant opposition. Second, we are no longer witnessing a local event, and this has been the case for several months, but today it's becoming more and more the case. It's a regional and an, and an international event, but both tracks are becoming more separate after uh, international efforts have failed. And, uh, and that's, that's very important because this is what's causing the internal dimension to change and the, op the opposition uh, to regroup. Regionally and internationally, the uprising involves the question of Palestine, the question of resistance, of balance of power in the region, and it involves international forces that are attempting to leverage their power in a changing region in relation to a number of issues. The dynamics of the uprising, there is really no time to discuss uh, things at, at length, but I uh, would like to address these uh, three basic points on the principal uh, structural cause, regime resilience and its limit, and the uh, direction of the uprising. Of course, when it comes to causes, we have all uh, talked about all kinds of causes in relation to all of the countries involved, and sometimes we erroneously group them as a monolithic uh, item entity, and I think that's very problematic, uh, barring some lower common denominators. But it is not a puzzle that uh, decades of dictatorship is part of the answer, but it certainly is not a sufficient answer. It's a necessary part of the answer or necessary part of the causes of the uprising. But dictatorship is not sufficient to produce mass mobilization. Dictatorship has existed for decades, and we did not necessarily have constant mass mobilization. So there must be something else. Economic disenfranchisement is also a necessary part of the cause, but it's not sufficient in and of itself. It is also important to recognize that for decades in Egypt or elsewhere, including in Syria, uh, economic disenfranchisement did not produce mass mobilization. So uh, what is it that uh, is happening then? In my view, we are witnessing a number of things that I cannot discuss at this point, but it involves the dictatorship element and uh, repression. It involves economic disenfranchisement as crudely as uh, I put it at this point. But it also is, there also is a factor of time. Uh, in my view, in Syria in particular, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we have reached a point where we got to a pressure cooker situation where the situation could have actually exploded at any moment, but there were various reasons why it was delayed. Whether it's the Iraqi war that produced a catastrophe next door that allowed people to sort of overvalue their stability within dictatorship, 
whether it is the attempt in the United States in 2005 to launch a strike against Syria after the Iraqi catastrophe, whether it's the uh, quote-unquote uh, attack on Syria to isolate Syria, the isolationist uh, or the, the attempt to isolate Syria from outside and from neighboring countries and the racism that we've heard, especially from the Lebanese against Syrians, not only the state but also the people after the assassination of Hariri. A lot of that gave the regime uh, sort of a... Uh, uh, an extension. But uh, I think with the development of uh, what I call dual polarization over the past 25 years, these two issues of politics and economics have reached a climax and that climax actually could have survived for a couple more years, if not more, except that the domino effect from the Tunisian and Egyptian situation created within the Syrian community, especially those most disenfranchised, a readiness to go and fight bombs with bullets. But that did not happen before the question of the pressure cooker that I discussed reached a point where it affected people's dignity. I do not think people who are not doing well economically or politically, and that's why political scientists cannot uh, predict uh, revolutions, I do not think that in and of itself can produce these uh, kinds of mobilizations. I think people's dignity were affected and differentially so, which is why we see different intensities within and between countries regarding mass mobilization. For people to fight bullets with their bodies, there must be, uh, en masse and almost ubiquitously within a country, there must be some sort of common element that produces this uh, direct harm to one's dignity. And this is what happened in all of the cases involved, including in Syria, where there was no outlet in, in any way, shape, or form for many of these people that have been disenfranchised politically or economically. But the structural cause I would like to discuss over and above these common causes is the um, dual polarization, the social and regional polarization that happened or was taking place in Syria caused by in the past caused by the past 25 years of economic policy that favored the business communities and the urban metropolitan cities at the expense of all the rest. In other words, we have a social uh, gap between rich and poor that has been produced by these economic policies that actually privileged the rich, the business communities, crudely put, and disenfranchised most of Syrian society, whereby 30 to 40 percent became under the poverty line in the early 2000s. And then we have a serious, of course, uh, disparity between uh, the countryside and the city whereby the state actually supported, invested uh, in the main metropolitan areas, neglected the countryside in, uh, in large measure, and that produced a kind of dual polarization that overlaps in the countryside. Hence, the people in the countryside have suffered the most. The intensity of the uprising is uh, highest in the countryside, and that was actually the, uh, the beginning point of the uprising in Syria, and I would argue in, in, in other cases as well. But I will stop here, uh, because I need to get to the Syrian uh, case. I, I need to stop comparing. Uh, plus, it's, it's less liability, because there are all kinds of experts here. Uh, the second, uh, oh, and the second point about this question of polarization is that we uh, do not pay attention, or many of us do not pay attention, to the question of um, migration that took place inside Syria. Between 2003 and 2010, we had at least 1.2 to 1.5 million people migrate from the countryside to the city as a to the cities as a result of the drought that, the really severe drought that took place as a result of scant rainfall in the countryside. That pressure actually debilitated much of the Syri smaller Syrian cities, Homs, Hama, Latakia, Dar'a, Idlib, and so on, but did not really cause the same uh, effect in the major metropolitan cities of Damascus and Aleppo because they have better infrastructure, high standard of living, and they've been able to uh, attract the capital inflows of Iraqi communities, business communities, or well-off communities that came to Syria after 2003 and settled mainly in the metropolitan cities. All of this explains for us the kind of geography of the uprising, and I don't think we can understand the development of the uprising and the quote-unquote relative resilience of, uh, so to speak, in quotation marks, of Damascus and Aleppo without these structural um, factors. Now, as a result, uh, we have, of course, uh, a stalemate at work, and that's the second point, and that stalemate uh, connects to the regime's resilience. In, in many ways, the regime is still powerful, but I think many of us exaggerate its resilience. However, the causes of the regime's resilience uh, are, can be divided into two parts. The first part has to do with the, its actual uh, cohesive and coherent nature. 
the regime in Syria uh, as much as uh, people try to argue that this is the case in Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, the regime in Syria is far more coherent and cohesive in the sense that its separate institutions do not have the kind of relative autonomy that is enjoyed by uh, the other cases or most of the other cases, in the sense that it is not possible in Syria for the head of the uh, army or the head of any other uh, institution within the regime to approach the leadership, the top leadership, or Bashar, or what have you, and ask for a diplomatic uh, solution, such as the top leadership leaving the country, or what have you. This doesn't exist not because people do not dare to do it, which is the mistake of a lot of analysts that think that, you know, you, if you say this, you're basically going to be canned. That's not the issue. The issue is that there is not an autonomous institution outside the top leadership, which is Param uh, uh, pyramidically structured that can actually have the resolve. It doesn't even have the um, uh, decision making, uh, not authority, but capability to actually present that as an option. The other components, of course, of the Syrian uh, regime can be discussed as the army, security services, party, bureaucracy, uh, and all of them in many ways are fused with the regime. And that happened in the 60s and 70s and 70s when the Ba'ath Party actually devolved authority, uh, sorry, when the authority of the Ba'ath Party was devolved from the party to the army in the 1960s, and then Hafez Assad in 1970, 71, during the collective movement, devolved the authority uh, or power actually from within the military and moved it to the more narrow and easily controllable security services. So we have 40 years of development, of institutional development that empties all of the other institutions uh, power and authority and autonomy in, 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 in short. So without a kind of uh, a decision at the very top, it's very difficult, which is actually shared by most of these institutions, not because they have authority, but because everyone in the regime for the past 40 years has been implicated in the atrocities of the top leadership. So defection within the regime is not a matter of whether uh, this will work or not. Defection is actually uh, akin to political suicide in most cases because people will not actually buy that defection. And that's a very intelligent um, uh, strategy that was uh, followed by uh, the Syrian regime and, and to some extent by Saddam Hussein. Now, uh, as a result of this cohesion, we have a zero-sum game where any kind of uh, decision to uh, or any kind of scenario must actually include an all or nothing uh, you know, possibility. And that is why the regime's effort to crush the uprising is fierce and extremely brutal. There is no uh, possibility of compromise. And that is why the opposition actually is quickly becoming militant and so on. Now, on the other side, the heterogeneity of society on the other side of the regime's coherence is making it difficult for collective action among these different parts of society that have actually become more divisive, not as a result of some natural orientalist you know, uh, pro uh, proposition about Arab societies, but as a function of the regime's policies that have actually brought most of the minorities to its side and the only majority uh, to the other side, which actually presents of some sort of a balance in Syria. So we do, ha we do not have a 10% Alawi dictatorship versus the other 90%. We have a much more balanced picture and that actually gets lost on a lot of people because they consider the situation one of a sectarian rule, of sectarian authoritarianism. That is certainly not the case. Uh, the, Ala, the regime in Syria is perhaps Alawi by constitution, but is not Alawi by policies. And we have a lot of rational reasons why a lot of the minority communities, whether it's the Christians, whether it's the Shi'is, Ismailis, uh, the Kurds who are Sunni but not Arab, and the Druze have a, a, a different calculation in terms of what to support and what not to support. On the other side of all of this is the opposition. The opposition is gaining ground, in, um, militarily speaking, and is also gaining ground in terms of adherence, and is gaining ground in terms of coordination. It is still much weaker than the regime militarily, but it certainly is gaining ground by the day. And time, as opposed to a lot of the people who are writing today, who say the regime is still strong. The regime is strong, but I think the strength is exaggerated, and I think in many ways time is not necessarily on the side of the regime. If it intends to rule in the long run because in my view the regime has lost not the power really the physical aspect of power but it has lost the authority to govern Syria in the long run except with um, extreme brutality and extreme brutality can only allow you to survive for so long so finally
Where are we going? I would like to address a couple of points. I would have liked, but I would like to get to the final point, and that is where are we going? And I think we still are in the same phase that started in November, or October or November, after the establishment of the SNC. So I actually will be repeating the same thing I've been saying, but in my notes here, I actually colored the titles. I made them different colors, so it seems like I'm saying something new. Uh, I think we are witnessing a transformation from a legitimate fight against dictatorship domestically to uh, something else, and that something else is an occasion or an opportunity for uh, regional and international powers to attempt to restructure power relations in the region, to redraw the political map. These two efforts are making things very confusing for a lot of people outside Syria and are making things extremely dangerous for people inside Syria. On the one hand, fighting dictatorship should always continue to be a legitimate struggle especially we're talking about, uh, that we're talking about a dictatorship of, five, of four to five decades that has been brutal in various ways, and that has actually went against its own principles and began to favor the haves over the have-nots, because it's the have-nots and because it's the countryside that brought it to power. This picture is completely the opposite today. In fact, the middle classes in Syria are afraid of this opposition because it is mainly a uh, rural opposition and uh, basically uh, the mass base of the opposition are certainly not the middle classes. So there is a very interesting opposition today or the very interesting situation where the Sunni, Christian and other middle and upper middle classes in Syria are basically standing on the side because they are afraid of the repetition of what happened in the 60s, except that the regime today is on the side of the usurpers. So uh, on that note, it's very important for us to recognize that the complexity is real. Some focus on the dictatorship, others focus on the external plans to deal with Syria in a way that benefits uh, actors like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Israel, the United States, Britain, and others. Uh, and the others are focusing on the question of um, uh, dictatorship only. And I think both uh, are right, except that there isn't an agency that, uh, that can bring about an opposition, at least not right now, and the agency, if it exists, is very weak you know, if we can talk about some of the members of the opposition, like Hatta Manna and his followers, for instance, there isn't an agency to be able, that is able to combine these two concerns of fighting dictatorship and fighting foreign intervention that is not in the, in the interest of Syrians and create some sort of institution, institutionalized, mass-based mobilization on that count. And that's the, the tragedy of the Syrian situation. Domestically, however, uh, this uh, situation is causing, as I said, a regrouping of the opposition on different grounds that will both strengthen it militarily but weaken its legitimacy, especially if it begins to fight sectarianism with sectarianism, brutality with brutality, thuggishness with thuggishness, which has definitely started on part of the opposition. Even, the human, right, even human Rights Watch is actually producing these reports, I think way too late, but it's still producing them about the opposition's uh, actions. This situation will also signal the demise of the SNC, the Syrian National Council, as an effective day-to-day -day player, unless it fundamentally restructures itself and it doesn't look like it's doing so because in the past two weeks it has lost many of its uh, strong uh, figures. The bottom line, before I break, is that in my view, so long as the regime is confident about its power, and it is confident about its power today, we are not likely to witness a political solution. Surely this might be a misplaced confidence, but it is the confidence that it feels nonetheless. And I, with that, I will break because if I continue, I'll say more depressing things and more, um, discuss more uh, problematic alternatives. So thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, <clears throat> greetings from Qatar and from Georgetown, specifically from Georgetown in Qatar. For those of you who didn't know, yes, Georgetown has a, an outpost in the middle of the Gulf. And of course, as you all know by now, Qatar really is the center of the world. Um, not least for the sorts of subjects we're discussing today. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was having dinner, uh, lunch with some interesting people, and the next table was Tony Blair. And then a couple of tables further on, talking about the subject we just, meant, uh, just finished on, Burhan Ghalyun and his crowd. Um, one of my previous visits, I bump into Musakusa. I mean, you know, where else but in Qatar? Um, so, um, 
I, I know that some, some of those, some of you who, who know where I'm based at the moment um, would expect me to say something about Qatar, and I will, but I'll also try to say something more general about uh, the, the, the GCC countries in this whole thing. Now, the problem that I've got is there are two aspects to it. On the one hand, some of the uh, dynamics that we've been discussing and the questions we've been discussing so far in the symposium, that's to say the domestic dynamics of authoritarianism and opposition. Um, and on the other hand, there is the foreign policy role that Joost uh, asked us to address. Um, I can't possibly deal with all of that satisfactorily within the 20 minutes, so I will inevitably leave a lot uncovered. What I'm hoping is that I'll touch upon a few things that will spark your interest, and then we can get really into the discussion in discussion time. So, um, on the one hand, there are foreign policy puzzles here about what, what's driven the foreign policies of these six states in the Arab Spring. And on the other hand, there are puzzles about the uh, comparatively, well, the relative strength, apparently, of these uh, regimes, indeed consolidation of these regime, regimes compared to some of the states we've seen, or regimes we've seen collapse. Um, now these two things, the foreign policy and the, um, the, the domestic um, consolidation or survival or domestic policy of the regimes, I think really are, can only sensibly be looked at as part of a bigger whole. And hence the, 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 the word omnibalancing in the title of the paper. <clears throat> For those of you um, conceptually inclined, you will have come across the term omnibalancing in work on um, international relations, um, foreign policy analysis. <clears throat> and while for, for many it might be self-evident, for a lot of IR theorists it apparently wasn't that you know, states' positioning in the, in the world and their foreign policies are as much driven by domestic considerations as they are by where they are in the international system. So the idea of omnibalancing is that a regime pursues its interests and its survival um, by looking at where, relatively speaking, in, the in its domestic and uh, international environment, its main resources and its main challenges are and then figures out how best to approach that combined puzzle. <clears throat> now, the GCC states have been doing that for a long time. Um, I think consciously, in fact, they've been doing that consciously for a long time. And one part of that was to ensure domestic consolidation and state survival by pursuing foreign policy that brought a major, the support of a major external hegemon, but combine that with complementary bridges being built to other players in the international system so that you were never left high and dry and so that your domestic or your regional competitors couldn't accuse you of being in anyone's pocket. Um, and if that game was played effectively, that could reinforce and consolidate domestic structures. <clears throat> and similarly, the stronger the domestic um, legitimacy or, or um, um, what's the word, uh, rootedness became or security became the more room for maneuver they had to play this international game pragmatically. And pragmatism is a critical uh, component uh, in this. So briefly over to the domestic specifically. And I think um, from what we just heard in the last presentation, um, this takes me back to yesterday and, and yesterday morning's uh, presentations. Policy matters. Um, the, the, it's not just structural questions that are uh, important, it is also what policies uh, regimes pursue, both generally in terms of do they deliver the goods to the populations, economic policy. Yeah. It was a clear choice that the Syrian regime took to shift towards the policy they've been pursuing for the past 20 odd years, whereas before it was different. Now, did they have a, a choice? That's another question, but um, policy matters. But it also matters in, in security. Uh, policy specifically. How do regimes deal with this? That's what um, Eva Bellin was talking about yesterday and it's also I think relevant in the case of the Gulf. I would suggest that some regime types, I'll be thinking about monarchies perhaps, um, have greater room for maneuver to adjust policy and hence might not need the same kind of harshness of coer coercive methods that other regimes might um, seek recourse to. Apart from policy mattering, what's also um, again been, what we've also been reminded of in the last presentation is, and, and throughout the discussion really, resources matter. And the Gulf, this is, is I think very, very evident. Resources matter, uh, resources matter for regimes, but also for the population um, and the potential opponents of regimes uh, 
their material interests matter and the extent to which their material interests are satisfied matter. But finally, ideas also matter. It's not just a question of material interest. Ideas matter. Ideas, the ideational factor, whether poured into structured ideologies or not, um, does matter very much. They do inflect, as Lisa Boudin was saying yesterday, the, um, the way in which material interests are interpreted. So, um, briefly sort of summing up the conceptual bit, um, crucial in understanding survival and indeed consolidation of certain types of, of, of authoritarian systems includes the fact of material interest, and in the case of the Gulf states, we are still uh, looking at rentier states. They're based on rent. Of course, rent doesn't define them completely. There are plenty of other factors there. And secondly, some of these other factors, first of all, well, they've, all they've always cut across the rentier dynamic, and secondly, they are now adding to it, They're increasingly, um, increasingly encroaching upon it, perhaps. But nevertheless, rent remains absolutely crucial. It gives the re regimes incomparable resources, and it also infuses um, um, social dynamics in a way that, that you don't quite see in states that are less defined that way. But, oh, oh, and th that leads me to the second point, you know, the, the ideational factor, the ideational factors. Um, the ideational and regime type and regime behavior are all interconnected in the case of the Gulf states. Essentially, they've gone for a rent-based, neo-traditional type state and policy and, and um, propaganda, etc. And by and large, or to a large extent, to a significant extent, populations have bought into this. As a result, the security apparatus has taken on a different nature, a different uh, shape um, in, in these states. And I, I, I acknowledge that they are very, very diverse with, amongst themselves. But first of all, they've generally been very effective. And secondly, they've needed, they have in fact needed uh, less need for blatant um, recourse to coercion at least compared to uh, what we've seen in other places. I'm sure you will come back to me about the case of Bahrain and so on, but um, w the, the case of Bahrain, in a sense, proves my, proves my point. It has far less resources. A, it had a far more problematic, um, less, co well, less um, coherent population. Of course, you have the Shia factor in there. You have a regime that prov proved singularly uh, bad, uh, inept, at responding to the challenges. And that has had a history of, of greater use of coercion and of course had recourse to it again in the recent, uh, in the recent troubles. So Bahrain is, is a bad example, in fact confirms the pattern that I'm trying to sketch. One of the elements of effectiveness of these regimes in the security field is outside the strict security structures. The ro a royal family like Saudi Arabia's is actually a very, very effective um, network for, for, for bringing up information from, uh, from across the country, from across the populations, and at the same time then for having patronage trickle down in, in, um, in fairly astute ways. The royal families also, generally speaking, have been very good at, at um, interacting, at, at helping to infuse the societies with that neo-traditional ideology. Um, by simple things like, you know, there's, there's a, a significant proportion of, of families who will have had weddings uh, where a member of the royal family is present, and this becomes a major talking point. Simple things like that. Okay, um, a, a quick footnote, and it's another instructive case is the case of Oman in this field. If you look at how Oman has responded to the pressures, the, the, the demonstrations, etc., it's an st a stunning contrast to Bahrain. First of all, yes, a number of people were locked up, but then very, very swiftly released for, for the most part. Secondly, uh, of course, yes, there was the usual buying off element in policy announcements, uh, economic buying off. But crucially, uh, people who'd been in government for a long time and who were identified by critics of the government as at the heart of the problem were suddenly removed. A very swift. In fact, two successive changes in, in the government, um, really clearing out virtually all the old hands that had been identified with, with the problems, with, with corruption, etc. So 
The Omani, the Omani government, effectively the Sultan Qaboos and his immediate advisors reacted proactively, quickly, and um, completely differently to, plus they gave the, uh, the, the Shura Council, which is already, the Masjid Shura, which is already fully elected, um, a great deal extra power. And they did all of that very swiftly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's, move, let's move then, or maybe I should first go to... Let me stick with the domestic for a bit and move across to just two, two, two brief other case studies. One, um, Saudi Arabia, because I was asked to speak specifically about Saudi Arabia. Okay, what happens in Saudi Arabia is you get um, you know, a, a lot of attention, a lot of fascination amongst the population, including amongst the royal family, for what was happening in Tunisia and then Egypt. Um, I was there several times when this was all happening, and as I say, even amongst you know, royal family members, they were transfixed by the whole business. Um, one of the interesting things that I found was that there was a generational gap. A, um, a, a very clear generational gap in a perception of what was going on. A similar kind of generational gap, arguably, that you had in Egypt amongst the regime. Um, you know, the older, the older guard simply not getting it, simply not understanding what's going on, whereas some of the younger ones um, uh, did. Um, and this is very, very, was very much the case in Saudi Arabia as well. So you had intellectuals calling for reform, um, as, as happens periodically. You had a first political party even set up in February 2011, the Islamic Ummah uh, Party. Of course, they were then all rounded up fairly, fairly swiftly. Um, the king returns from his, um, from his health you know, excursion, uh, his operation, <clears throat> recurs, uh, re returns rather more swiftly than he might otherwise have done. And a number of degrees, decrees are issued announcing all kinds of goodies for the population um, in economic terms, a, a really blatant case of trying to buy people off, and it was, it was seen as, as such by, by most. Um, but then also um, municipal elections were held in September 2011, not perhaps that important. Um, women were given a vote in the Shura Council uh, for 2013, for the elections in 2013. Um, and, but as part of all that, one, one of the things that also happened was that the regime was clearly trying to consolidate itself, its own support base, by um, raising the respect in which, or, or showing the, uh, the, the religious establishment that they were held in great respect. Um, they were, it was made you know, impermissible to criticize the highest religious author authorities, for instance. They were giving lots of extra money and so on. But interestingly, as time goes on, you then get other kinds of pronouncements saying that the mutawa'in, the, the religious police, ought to behave with consideration and gentleness uh, towards, towards people. So you get that, that interesting balancing even in that respect. Of course, when it comes to the uprising in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia stands out by, um, by intervening. Effectively, the, the so-called GCC intervention in, Saudi Arabia, uh, sorry, in Bahrain was really a Saudi intervention and they want a GCC cover for this. Um, the Qataris, this is something that's often raised, yes, Qatar with all its liberalization and the pro-revolutionary rhetoric in Al Jazeera, they went into Bahrain, didn't they? Yes, but this wasn't their choice. Um, they basically felt, they th uh, as far as I can see, they thought it was a stupid uh, policy, but they had no choice but to go along with, with the Saudis on this occasion. Um, Saudi Arabia went in there because of its particular fear that twofold fear that this might become um, a Shia inspired and therefore Iranian controlled overthrow of, uh, of a monarchy within the Gulf and that was not acceptable. Saudi Arabia has its own problems in the Eastern province and indeed in the Eastern province is the one area where serious trouble has broken out. Um, coercion has been used, uh, people have been killed but it was, it's never been on a mass basis and there is also a longer running pattern of King Abdullah at least uh, trying to um, talk to the grievances that the Shia community has. I just want to um, give you a couple of in, um, interesting insights from a poll that was held, a credible poll that was held in Saudi Arabia um, across the country um, under the auspice of the Arab Reform Initiative. 
because um, <clears throat> I think it tells you something about why the day of rage in Saudi Arabia didn't really happen. I mean, it was, it was something. It was very minor. Um, if you look at what people said their main, their main concern was, the main challenge for, this, for Saudi Arabia, it was, had nothing, it was very little about the sort of things that drove, um, you know, it's, it, it's not anti-regime feeling, let's put it that way. 50% listed the economic situation, poverty, unemployment, and inflation. 16% corruption. And 9%, this, this again shows show you something interesting, 9% um, divorce and spinsterhood. 6% the financial burden of um, marriage. The, the second, if you look at what their second concern was, 19% was drugs, 16% corruption again, and 13% traffic accidents. So um, the, the, it kind of sketches a type of concern that's very practical um, to do with day-to-day -day needs. At the same time, what it also showed was that over 60% had either great or moderate um, confidence in the government's ability to deal with these challenges. And even though economic concerns were high up in people's agenda, 70% nevertheless thought the, the economic cli uh, climate in Saudi Arabia was good or very good. When you, th when you then move to uh, values about you know, democratiz democratization, etc., over half thought democracy the dem dem democratic system is better than other systems. Interesting. However, um, and half found an authoritarian system absolutely inappropriate, but only about 30%, less than 30%, uh, nevertheless thought that democra democracy was appropriate or very appropriate for Saudi Arabia. So you get these two poles you know, in Saudi Arabia, um, each probably representing about a quarter of opinion um, and it's worth noting that just over half thought that a political system governed by Sharia without elections uh, as, uh, is either appropriate or very appropriate. Um, so the, the comment that a, a colleague of mine uh, and friend who was involved in this uh, made was that the majority of Saudis probably see democ democracy or democratization not as a political um, think, not something political, but they view it in a socio-economic manner, linking it to uh, um, division of uh, this, the spoils, really, I guess, uh, just distribution of, of wealth and things like this. And equally telling is that in Saudi Arabia, only 4% said they do not trust the government. And only 4% thought that government institutions have performed badly. I thought these, these are, these are, I think these are, you know, you can always question the accuracy of polls like this, but this is a similar poll and similar methodology as was used throughout the rest of the region. Um, and it does, I think it does tell us something. It tells us again that resources matter, that the satisfaction of material interests matter. But I think one has to encapsulate that in a wider picture of um, how these regimes have been able to play on traditional themes have reinvented them, have incorporated parts of society into this new neo-traditional game. Things like camel races, you know, it's, it's an invention, it's a new invention which has become part of, the, um, of this supposedly harking back to the past policies. Cultural festivals, Janadaria in Saudi Arabia and so on. Now in Qatar, and maybe I should finish off with that and then leave the whole thing about GCC foreign policy and the Arab Spring for discussion. Um, in Qatar, the, some of you may remember there was a website with websites up calling for people to attend the Day of Rage. Pictures of the Amir and Sheikh Hamoza with big red crosses through it and things like this and plenty of signatories. And I always thought at the time, I bet, you know, an, a website, you can't say where it's actually hosted. I bet none of these, or virtually none of these signatures are Gattery. And in fact, the day of rage came and went and there was nothing, n nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, the case of Qatar, and we've got a few people here who have spent a lot, long time in Qatar, and indeed at Georgetown in Qatar. Um, but 
the case of Qatar, I think, shows that while there are very significant con social concerns about the speed of modernization, about identity, about Arab language, and while there are div divisions in all of this, even within the, uh, sorry, within the ruling Al Thani, none of that comes anywhere near kind of revolutionary demands or demands to overthrow the regime. Um, you know, and it's not surprising. On the one hand, you do have this regime policy that consciously and successfully plays the neo-traditional card. On the other hand, you've got massive resources per head of the population. It is the richest country in the world um, in terms of its nationals. There are other things that people pursue in terms of their daily concerns. It, they're not political. One final point, um, again, I'll stick with the domestic for now. In the discussion about what sorts of factors drive um, generally drive democratization and, and the overthrow of authoritarian systems. Modernization theory, I think, is too simplistic, and I, I, I expect we, we all agree with that, but there are the elements within it, like education, is an important indicator. Um, of course, now recently we've all been talking about IT and uh, communication technologies as, as an important factor. And I think, yes, these things are important, but only, only as part of the overall, of, of the, the total picture. And if you look at, for instance, penetration of communications technology and, and, and IT and web activity in places like Qatar, the Gulf states, and particularly Saudi Arabia, um, so, say, the, the, it's higher than in many other places, much higher. And indeed, the same poll that I just talked about in Saudi Arabia showed Saudis being much more politically active in such web discussions than in other places. So it's interesting to see that that is there, but it does not translate into an overarching uh, commitment to political change of, of a radical nature. Okay, so the foreign policy discussion time. I'm very grateful for all of the speakers for staying within the time limit because that means we now have uh, half an hour uh, for uh, questions and answers. Um, and um, I will simply proceed by disenfranchising the audience by uh, uh, asking the first questions myself. Um, but I will give you plenty of time uh, after that. Um, I just, uh, uh, I'm not going to discuss the, um, or, or to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm listed as a discussant, but I'll just stick to uh, asking some questions of, of, of each of the three um, uh, speakers, just as an introduction. The, um, uh, Stacy um, um, uh, raised the issue of identity uh, in, uh, in Yemen. Of course, identity is, is, a, is a perennial issue there and uh, you know the question of the Hirak and the Houthis uh, is, uh, has, has been around you you alluded to that um, and you mentioned also you know so, sort of the Yemen was always uh, you know frag fragmenting and um, predicted to predicted to fall apart and it, and it never did and it was sort of a joke you know uh, people who said uh, you know Yemen things are falling apart but it's they've been saying that for 20 30 years and it somehow uh, held together and it sort of became a question of, 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 of this is a country that was decentralized by default um, um, and somehow that, that worked. The, uh, I remember going to, to England to some conference two or three years ago and anybody of you, of you who knows uh, Peter Galbraith, um, you know, who was of, of Iraq fame where he had um, uh, advocated uh, partition uh, of the country into three parts and he was at this conference and I said, Peter, what are you doing here? Because it, I thought it was odd that he was uh, doing something on Yemen and um, he was just sort of hemming and hawing and saying he was just interested in Yemen. After the first session that day, um, in, the, in the questions and answers, he, he, he raised his hand and piped up and said, uh, isn't it a good idea to divide Yemen into three parts? Um, so anyway, um, the, uh, my, the question I have is, is, is um, you know, uh, you mentioned that there was some alliance now between the Houthis and, and the Hirak. Uh, uh, that, it had, that had been enabled by, by, the, by the uprising in, in Yemen and by the, the fact that people uh, are able to, to express their dissimilarity uh, and, and express their identities, but still with, uh, under the Yemeni flag. And um, I'm just wondering wh whether the, um, because, because the, 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 ab the, the vacuum in the center is, is essentially empowering these groups, which are, which are deeply uh, you know, disenfranchised and discontented about the center, um, uh, further away from it. And when you see an alliance between those two in, two in particular, it's clearly not some, because they love each other or that they want to have anything with, to do with each other in the future, but because they see them, uh, them as tactical, each other as tactical, tactical allies, I'm sorry. 
uh, against uh, the new order that might emerge, which is, which is currently very weak. So do you see this contributing to, to centrifugal forces in, uh, um, uh, in Yemen, and basically making you know, uh, Peter Galbraith's dream come true? Or, or, or how, do you, how do you read that? That's, that's the question for Stacy. For Bassam, on this most depressing uh, subject, um, you, you raised the issue of sectarianism, and I, I, I totally agree, uh, if, if that's what you said, that, that, that the, the Alawite question is overstated, and it's very facile to say that the regime is Alawite in nature. You know, um, it is not. It, uh, you know, it's clearly a political regime that has uh, you know, elements uh, predominantly from, I mean, from, uh, it definitely has a significant Alawite element, but it has many other elements as well. The society generally is, is highly heterogeneous, as you said. Um, but I just want you to, to, could you elaborate that a little bit, bit further, because certainly the perception on the outside, as it was in Iraq before, is of, of very clearly defined op, uh, polarizing op opposite identities, and, and that particular attention given to it makes things worse, uh, in my experience. So I want to, see, uh, want to hear what, what you have to say about that particular dynamic, and, and to what extent there is actually uh, going to, you know, um, a, a, a uh, sort of, uh, at least among, among the, the Alawite elements within the regime, an attempt to, to hold on to power simply because they, they think that uh, they will be singled out as Alawites if and when the regime falls. Finally, for Gerd, uh, since he, there were a number of issues he didn't discuss, and I don't know what these issues were, the, it's a, it's a free-for-all as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I want to ask you about um, uh, the differences in foreign policy fueled by domestic concerns between Saudi Arabia and Qatar toward the Arab Spring, uh, and, and maybe raising the issue of, of religion to some extent, uh, because uh, you know both regimes have uh, some uh, religious grounding, um, Saudi Arabia maybe more than, than Qatar, especially the difference between sort of support for the Muslim Brotherhood vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Salafis in, in, in the region. Uh, just be curious if you have anything interesting to say about that from your vantage point in, in Qatar and your many visits to, to, to Saudi Arabia. So I'll leave it at that. And then after, I g give the uh, panelists a chance to address these extremely difficult questions. Then maybe we can open up the floor and I'll take uh, maybe two or three questions at a time, uh, group them, and if you could identify yourself and say, uh, and first of all, and ask a question, um, short comment maybe, but ask a question and say to whom you're addressing the question, I would be very grateful, thank you. So, you, yeah, let's go in the same order for now. Um, Okay, I mean, I think this is an interesting way of framing it. Is there decentralization by default, when in fact decentralization has been a pretty central desire of a lot of different actors um, since well before the, the revolutionary movement? Um, you know, I, I, I'm skeptical about, not entirely skeptical, but I'm somewhat skeptical about the idea of tactical alliance, because I think the experience of alliance can be transformative in more durable ways. That said, when I referred to the Houthis and the Harak, uh, what I was talking about specifically was their affirmation of the idea of decentralization, which, and, and each other's stake in decentralization, so that, you know, Houthis are pointing to the Harak and talking about their, their right to achieve some level of autonomy in the South and vice versa. Um, you know, I think the debate, honestly, there's a big gulf right now between U.S. and European attitudes towards this issue, and I, I'm concerned that it, that the debate in, in Europe seems to be much more decentralization versus out outright secession on the part of the South, and here I see people talking much more about the need for greater centralization. Um, and, and so there's a big difference among external actors, and external actors are helping to structure the national dialogue where this is the type of stuff that theoretically is going to get settled. I'm really, uh, I, I don't want to give any support to Galbraith's petition it in three parts thing because I don't think anybody should be drawing up maps, right? That's a, a really problematic enterprise. Um, but I do think that the, the, the current reality is that um, in Yemeni circles, opposition regime, almost across the board, the territorial configuration of the state is very much a central topic. Um, that said, within the Herak, there's a lot of diversity and, um, and decentralization within that movement itself. And so uh, a strongly secessionist contingent, 
um, which I think gains ground by the approach of the national dialogue because there's now an incentive for Southerners to organize in a way to try and assert essentially a veto in that structure. Um, and, I, and I am concerned about it going that way, particularly for people in Taiz or Hodeida or even in Hadramaut who, who don't just want to see North-South be the particular way in which the territorial question is, is resolved, if, if it is. Um, you know, the, the question of sectarianism in Syria is, uh, is uh, compelling if, if, if um, people don't know Syria. So um, on the one hand, there is sectarianism, of course, and the sectarianism of the regime has increased dramatically uh, during the war. And it has increased not necessarily as regime policy per se, but it, it has increased as a function of behavior of people that sort of uh, are connected with the regime, whether they are the uh, security forces or the police or Shabiha or what have you. And then, of course, we have a response from uh, members of the opposition that is similar in kind, but not at first. At first, the first six months or a few months, I don't want to give a, an exact number, you, had, uh, you did have some, some sort of a legitimate uh, opposition in most of its garbs and most of its dimensions. And then with time, uh, as a function of the brutality of the regime, and this is not something that we could just simply say that the opposition turned X or Y uh, just because of the nature of people in the opposition, there was a situation where people were responding to existing uh, uh, brutality in ways that uh, uh, for them was rational, that maximized effect, and sometimes that goes in the direction of primordial identities and uh, responding in kind. So the YouTube videos you'll see the first few months are mostly about you know, uh, videos and songs and, and even art about the importance of fighting dictatorship. In the last four or five months, you have a proliferation of videos and art and, 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 and Facebook comments and so on that are uh, extremely sectarian from the opposition, completely different than, the, the, than the, uh, during the first part. So I think we talk about sectarianism in the region and in Syria as if uh, had there been something here in the United States, some sort of fracture along you know, the same lines, we will see the same kind of sectarianism uh, or you know, prejudice or racism on, on so many fronts. So this will happen in any society in times of crisis. Structurally, however, uh, I just want to emphasize that there are reasons beyond being Alawi mm -hmm. that uh, people have for supporting the regime. And these are the reasons that we've written, I've written about before even we started, or the uprising started about two weeks before, and they still hold. Uh, whether we support those reasons or not, uh, minorities, support the regime. The Christian minority supports the regime, not all of it, and of course there are uh, uh, serious schisms. And I know this from my own family in Syria that are, are split on this question. But generally minorities support the regime because the regime supports uh, them in various ways. In uh, Damascus, uh, around Easter, there are more security services protecting churches than, you know, than, than uh, you'd find uh, maybe in an uprising. Uh, you know, which makes you think that Jesus is actually coming to the, to the event. Um, and second, uh, you have the business community in the upper middle and upper middle classes who are uh, concentrated in, in Damascus and in Aleppo. And these people are not minorities only. A lot of these people are urban Sunni folks that don't even care for the regime. Uh, just like many of the Christians who do not care for the regime. In fact, I argue that many Alawis don't even care for the regime in and of itself. Uh, a lot of the Alawis in Syria are in a very tough predicament and in fact right now are, fort are actually creating fortresses around their villages because they know that if the regime falls, they're going to get it. And they do resent the regime for that because they have not actually, and this is the proof of the first point about you know, not having Alawi policies in Syria for the majority of the Alawis, this is proof that they actually haven't benefited necessarily more than the average Syrian. Uh, I mean, if you do have like a, a security service officer who goes back and rebuilds his village or her village, usually his, and uh, you benefit from that, then you know, that's, th that does exist. But for the most part, there is no uh, like special benefits for the 
overwhelming majority of Alawis in society. It's kind of, and, and they are in a tough predicament. Uh, for instance, when I was in a similar way, I, when I was in Beirut during the Civil War, I was living in an area in Beirut which I did not support politically. But when we were being bombarded, you know, I wasn't hoping for more bombardment. It was tough. It was, a, it was like a fragmented... <laughs> I wanted these guys that I didn't care for to fight back. Uh, I mean, it's, it's what I can call, you know, what we can call fragmented rationality. It's like, uh, so, so that's that. And then finally, uh, the resistance camp. So you have the minorities, it's a class issue, the cla upper middle classes and the middle classes, and then, then you have the resistance camp. There are many people inside and outside Syria who support Syria's resistance uh, role, not in the sense that Syria is actually an agent of resistance, but in the sense that Syria is an enabler of resistance and its support of uh, groups like Hezbollah, we can't even say Hamas anymore because Hamas bolted, but like Hezbollah, uh, who actually is the only group uh, or party or organization in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict that has, uh, that came close or did actually humiliate uh, this, the Israeli army. And it cannot be taken at, uh, you know, lightly, even if Hezbollah has problematic domestic policies in Beirut, or even if Hezbollah is not uh, sort of an ideal, uh, you know, uh, uh, formula for, for, for uh, governance. So uh, this resistance camp, in addition to the class question, in addition to the minorities in the region, in, in Syria, who, as I said, support the regime because of the fear of the alternative, uh, and in addition, of course, to the actual, you know, core of the Syrian uh, regime, including its bureaucracy, including its top military uh, officers and upper middle level officers, including all of the security apparatuses, you know, almost wholesale. Uh, that makes for a non-sectarian situation within which a lot of sectarianism is taking place. So if we want a clear-cut black and white picture, it doesn't exist. Generally speaking, structurally speaking, uh, it is not a sectarian situation. Right, foreign policy. It was promised, so is, that, is this thing on? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, I think I, I'll start by saying one of the, sorry, that's a bit more, one of the, one of the key factors is um, in, in any state's foreign policy, it's, it's that connection between foreign policy and domestic policy. So the more secure they are domestically, the more room for maneuver they've got to play internationally if they are so inclined. That doesn't guarantee the outcome, but at least you know it, it gives them the opportunity. And what I'd say for for, for starters is that what I what I ended up saying with my presentation in Qatar, the regime is actually very secure, and that's part of the explanation for its room for maneuver for experimentation abroad. In Saudi Arabia, it's uh, you know, it's a little bit more complex. But then there are other factors that come into it as well, and as, again, I, I, I hinted at them. Both have access to very uh, large uh, resources, which they can deploy if, if so inclined. In Qatar, actually, it's relatively speaking even greater. Um, that's only rel relative. Secondly, a lot depend, it depends in all of these GCC states, the Gulf states, on personal politics. I mean, foreign policy is, is a matter of sheikhly relations, really. It's, it's very, very personal. It's not really institutionalized. Um, and so a lot then depends on the personal opinions, views, inclinations, biases of the key players at the top. Um, and that, that's where, where, and of the nature of who, who these people are. And that's what I, where the thing I, I, I mentioned about the generational uh, gap comes in. In the case of Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah, for instance, really couldn't, couldn't, didn't get what was going on in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And even, it was, it was even fairly limited in the case of Tunisia. They, they didn't, you know, they had no illusions about Ben Ali. But they did, the older guard in Saudi Arabia had illusions about Mubarak, because they thought back to, you know, 20, 30 years earlier, when he'd been a, an apparently decent kind of administrator, a manager of, of, of Egypt, and someone with whom they'd had very long-standing personal connections. And the personal again comes in. So it's very, very hard for that older guard to to drop this personal element. I mean, politics is very personal um, for those guys. Um, so that explains why Saudi Arabia was much slower in coming around um, to, to a recognition that the game had changed in Egypt than, than, than Qatar was. A third element is, or a, four, a fourth element in uh, understanding foreign policy making, 
is the structure of decision making and the composition of you know, who are those guys and, and how many of them are there and where they're sitting. Saudi Arabia, you have a number of very powerful princes with lots of resources at their disposal, but there are a good number of them with all, and all have their own particular fief. It's much harder to get coherence in this, particularly if the king is an old man, very old man, who was abroad and just in, you know, had, had very serious surgery, and when the crown prince died halfway through, and the number three also uh, had health issues, etc. Um, Saudi policy has, has long, and, and this was true even in the case of Yemen for a very long time, um, was very diffuse, very hard to get, get a grip on what was actually going on, who was going to control the Yemen file once Grand Prince Sultan was kind of out of the picture. Um, so it, it took longer, and generally speaking, Sa the Saudis have been, with a few exceptions, slow to come to a concerted um, position on these things. The Qataris, on the other hand, you've got three people making policy. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, maybe, maybe, maybe four or five if you take the immediate um, sort of trusted, really trusted advisors um, alongside. So, and, and, and the, the, two, the two at the top, Hamad bin Khalifa, the Amir, and Hamad bin Jassim, Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, are on, many, on most issues of, of, a, of a similar kind of mind. And they're also um, very much inclined personally to think that as long as you kind of understand the situation and you've got the resources and it's in your interest to try and take the sting out of a conflict, come on, let's just get in there and do it. That sort of attitude is very much, a, you know, it's a kind of a character trait. If you put all that together, you have the resources, you have a determination, uh, you have a coherent, very small set of people making the decisions, you can have quick, uh, effective decision making. Follow up may be another matter, because again, there is not really much of an institutional basis for this, but that, that's part of what explains it. Now, um, you know, there is this apparent paradox between an authoritarian system in, in Qatar, because it's no democracy, even though the Constitution has prescribed elections, which are now, ha have, been, have been announced for next year. And I think now it's more likely that, that the promise is going to come true than before. But anyway, it's still an authoritarian system uh, at the moment. Um, and even when the elections happen, in effect, the, Amir, the Amir's word will remain law or Sheikh um, Moses, some, in, some, uh, in some respects. Um, <clears throat> how come that a state like that has, has been pushing all this, this, um, this democratization and revolution? Well, they've not been pushing it. Um, of course, people say, yes, but they have because Al Jazeera. Well, Al Jazeera, to my mind, is part, part of this omnibalancing game. Um, what happened was that uh, Sheikh Hamad came to power, um, took power from of his father, Within a year, there was a counter-coup attempt, which the Saudi, Saudi Arabia, at the very least, didn't actively oppose. That then completely determined uh, Qatari policy, to, uh, almost completely determined Qatari policy ever since. Um, although relations have now am ameliorated, what you do is you get protection against this potential threat, mm -hmm. and that's bring in the biggest base for the, for, for, you know, for the USA establish that base, but then make, make a counterbalance it by setting up things like Al Jazeera, showing that you are flying the flag for the Arab cause, um, and, and maintaining relations with everybody around, Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, etc. Um, a typical example of that long-term pattern I described at the beginning of my presentation, but more consistently and, and if, uh, um, what's the word, concertedly followed by Qatar than almost anybody else. Um, and when it then came to the, these revolutions beginning to unfold, I think what was happening was that, the, that Qatar, already having Jazeera in play, simply realized, you know, when I say Qatar, is the leadership, you know, those people, simply realizing this was now the nature of the game. The game had changed. So let's get ahead of the curve, instead of being caught up afterwards and being caught on the wrong side of history, um, and get in there build on the relationships we already have. Lots of exiles, of course, are based in Qatar. And again, those personal relationships then in part help to explain what kind of subsequent relationships there have been with certain groups in Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, and so on. Um, the support for some of the Islamist factions, to my mind, have nothing to do with the Islamist agenda on the part of Qatar at all. Um, it is, it's simply a partly a reflection of some of those previously established personal relationships, 
and secondly, uh, a reflection of their recognition that in the new politics of the region, these Islamist groups of various strands are going to be a very important part of the picture, absolutely inevitably. So again, get in there, build those relationships, get the kudos for them, you know, be with the game, be ahead of the curve rather than behind. Um, so I think, and, and then all of it, again, you've, it has to be put in the, the wider context of Qatar's policy of you know, b building its brand and raising its profile. It's, it's all part of this too. So uh, I think that, is that making sense? There's maybe one footnote on, on, on Yemen because Saudi Arabia has had, what's typified Saudi Arabia of course is it's always seen it, or the Saudi, the Al Saud, have always seen themselves as the natural dominant actor in the, in the peninsula. And they have very long standing links to players in Yemen. And, and that, again, personal linkages and, and patronage, um, which they weren't gonna give up. And also a suspicion of course of the Shia. Um, which all, all ties, uh, ties together. In Qatar, there's a societal suspicion of Shia, but there isn't really at the top level such a, a paranoia about them as, as you find amongst some in, um, uh, among the Saudi elite. Mm -hmm. All right, please, the uh, floor is open. identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Vivian Salama. I'm a journalist. Um, GCC has been my home for the last four years. And I'm writing actually about Saudi Arabia and the Arab Spring right now, so it's kind of my obsession. Sorry, Qatar is not my obsession. <laughs> um, but I was wondering if you can comment sort of on two parts, because Saudi was a bit of a deer in the headlights when Egypt and Tunisia were going on. We're seeing it become a lot more vocal now, especially with what's happening in Syria, following Qatar's lead in providing arms for the Syrian opposition. You even have Russia accusing Saudi Arabia of sponsoring terrorism and things like that. So I'm wondering, um, in your opinion, and also Bassam, if you want to comment, you know, what extent do you think Saudi Arabia is willing to go to kind of um, participate or help Syria to make sure, basically going to the Iran issue, to make sure that it is the dominant force in Syria and not Iran? And the second part also, um, I'm wondering, uh, what your thoughts are on U.S.-Saudi relations, particularly after the whole Bahrain incident. I know a lot of people I spoke to in the Gulf were very disappointed that the U.S. did not do more to support the regime in Bahrain against Iran. And so, and a lot of people said that it really um, hurt relationship, the relationship. To what extent do you think Saudi is willing to kind of hurt that relationship or is it just kind of rhetoric and nothing more? Thanks. Any other questions? I have a question. I'm Lisa Wedeen from the University of Chicago. Thank you very much for excellent presentations. I have a question for Bassam and a question for Gert. The question for Bassam is, Bassam, I loved your presentation and I uh, loved your book and it was very helpful to me. I've learned a lot from it. My question is about something you said though towards the end of your presentation, which was that and it seemed incoherently related to the rest of your presentation, in fact, because you suggested that, you know, excessive brutality can only go so far. Those were your words, actually. I wrote them down, but I remember them. Um, and, uh, well, my question is that, I mean, why do you think that? I mean, why can't we just say that excessive brutality goes far enough and that the regime will survive this? That it's very possible, given also the reluctance of Damascus and Aleppo to join the uh, de peaceful demonstrations in the street, given their kind of affective investments and their material investments in, if not support of the regime, not support of the opposition either. And I think your notion of fragmented rationality is a good one. I called it ambivalence yesterday, and I think there's a lot of ambivalence. And there will be more so over time, it seems to me. Um, but in any case, I just, uh, you know, I think of China, I think of North Korea, I think of plenty of places where excessive brutality actually does help to maintain the regime. Uh, so I was wondering why you ultimately said excessive brutality can only go so far and whether you meant that. Um, for for Gert, I just wanted to ask you to clarify a little bit more about uh, Doha's role. Uh, 
um, and the personal relationships, and in particular in relationship to Syria, because it's a question to me why it is that Qatar ended up divorcing itself so readily from the Syrian regime, given the fact that personal relationships were actually, by most accounts, rather uh, amiable between the two regimes, and in, in some ways Doha had taken Syria on as its adopted have-not cousin or something. So I, I wonder, there are rumors about what happened that also suggest a kind of a breach of a personal relationship relationship, but I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Very good, thank you. One more, or shall we? No, no takers for now? All right, then uh, please take, take a side. Who goes first? Okay, yeah, okay, um, <laughs> okay I'll, I'll go first. Um, as, as to your question, Lisa, about the, uh, the last comment, I, okay, I take it back. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I actually, uh, I think, uh, I mean, w the caveat here is, is not whether excessive brutality uh, is, is, is good for stability. Uh, I'm not referring to the brutality that existed in Syria uh, bet between the 60s until 2011, early 2011, or what exists in China or in, in, in Korea right now, North Korea. I'm referring to the existing, right now, the existing brutality of today whereby uh, by active military suppression on a daily basis, this will not produce uh, any stable formula for governance in the future. And I'm convinced that, I mean, based on my connections with people in Syria, based on what's happening in, in different villages and different provinces and what's happening within the opposition, both the opposition that in my view has gone cuckoo and the other part of the opposition that is actually uh, aware of uh, the larger picture, not just the internal uh, situation, and based on those who are you know, passively supporting the status quo and those who, uh, well I don't know many of those people, but those who actually support the regime directly, uh, this current situation, based on discussions with a lot of these people, the common denominator among them is that this situation cannot continue as it is. So in that sense, this kind of brutality was not conducive to the regime's, uh, uh, the regime remaining as, uh, at the helm for very much longer. If the regime, however, or if the situation, or as what usually happens with the situation of Syria, the case of Syria, where other players start to, to mess up and the regime benefits from this fortune, which is basically what happened between 2005 and 2008, uh, the, uh, there might be a situation where a lot of the people on the sidelines will begin uh, uh, reappraising uh, the situation and will begin supporting the status quo a lot more, especially if the opposition uh, becomes uh, militant in a problematic way and begins to adopt some of the tactics of the regime, then it will be uh, back again to the same dilemma that exists or the same situation, strategic situation of uh, what I call the lesser evil situation. And in that sense, the regime could uh, regain some control without the need for uh, excessive military suppression on a daily basis nearly everywhere, including increasingly in Aleppo and Damascus. So, so uh, to clarify, uh, if we are witnessing this situation uh, today, if this situation that we're witnessing continues, I don't think the regime can uh, survive very long under any circumstances for various reasons, because it will actually begin to eat up at the, at the core of the regime in various ways, including at the people who are now um, uh, not only loyal, but, but uh, would actually fight and die for the regime uh, in particular uh, circumstances would do so, but under other circumstances, if this becomes more protracted, I think that will change. So, uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's what I think about, uh, about the question of violence. Uh, people inside Syria today, I just want to clarify the point about support for the, I don't mean to say, or I never meant to say support for the regime. I think it's best to think of support, uh, of this support as being for the status quo. Now this support uh, may include direct support for the regime, but in the majority of cases, if there's a percentage, and I'm not gonna give a number, that supports the status quo, and it's, a, it's not an insignificant percentage. This, uh, uh, 
these people uh, are supportive of the status quo much more so than the regime. And I think you will begin seeing a breakdown in this, within this group when the impending fall of the regime is at hand. You'll begin seeing a sort of a realignment. But until then, there's, there's, there's sufficient support for the regime to survive uh, for some time, but not under the current conditions. I think that will begin to break down unless, unless we have some serious changes internally. And I think it, is, it does depend on the strategies that the opposition adopts uh, inside Syria and, and outside Syria. Okay. Um. Well, I mean, uh, there, there, are, there are other people here who know at least uh, as much or more, more than myself about the, the goings on inside Arabia and the calculations. I mean, John Duke Anthony is here amongst others, so I, every, you know, feel free to contribute. Um, I think the, right, the, um, let me see my notes. Uh -huh. Saudi Arabia, I think, has undergone um, a learning process. Um, as I said, initially, the the elderly, the, the elderly princes didn't quite get it, what was going on in Egypt and so on. But of course, they saw very quickly what was happening. And ultimately, they, they are, as I say, they are arch pragmatists, like the other Gulf rulers, and realized that um, this was, the nature of the game had changed. And at that point, you have a critical um, trigger coming in, which is the Libya case. And that explains a lot of what happened in the GCC subsequently because nobody liked Gaddafi. And of course, he had specifically threatened King Abdullah before, apart from a whole series of insults. Now that's given the personal nature of rule and the assumptions about proper sheikhly relations in, among Gulf rulers, that's, you know, that, that's, that's a killer. Um, so when, when Libya came along as the third in this row, that's what helped um, the Qatari preferences uh, pushed through and, and they, they got the whole GCC on their side along with Saudi Arabia in this case and the UAE. Um, it's, so I think it's having gone through this, you've got a different mindset amongst the, the, uh, the Saudi ruling elite uh, when it came to Syria. But even then, um, there, well, there, Syria of course has always been this, this question about it, Syria being seen as an ally of Iran in, and in the increasing concern for Shiism as a political um, factor, that also played. However, I think again, there is, you can't underestimate this personal sense of what's right and proper for somebody like King Abdullah. Um, when, I, I'm, I'm convinced that when he was commenting on the, the, the huge you know, the size of the bloodshed in, in Damascus, particularly after having tried to reason with Bashar and with contacts, uh, he had long established contacts, family contacts and so on in, in, in Syria, um, that this was then continuing, to, this continued to, 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 to escalate. I think he also saw that as a personal slight and, and that he just had, had no, 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 no respect at all left for, um, for, for Bashar himself and the rest of the regime. Um, Doha, on the other hand, I think what we have now is a, a mirror image of what was there bef before all of this erupted. As you're saying, they had a long established relationship with uh, Damascus and they had good personal relations. Well, that was part, that was all part of, on the one, of, of the pattern that was established for, for quite a while. That's to say, strategic thinking and you know, keeping your options open, your, your relationships with everybody if you possibly can. Um, and, and, and also make that part of your brand that you do have, you are seen as having all these connections and these links and that nobody can accuse you of being in anybody else's pocket. What happens after, afterwards is similarly, it would, you know, again, they try to, do, to not intervene, they try to nudge and, and persuade and so on using the personal relationships and were totally rebuffed. Um, so once this happens and you then get this escalation of the situation in Syria, it doesn't, suit the strategic aims anymore, nor does it suit the brand uh, strategy um, to pursue, to, to continue to be, to cozy up to, uh, to Damascus. And again, you know, we're in, we're in number four by now, or number five. So suddenly, to, n not to, to pursue the same strategy as you've been telling the world was the only possible strategy in the other cases, just wouldn't have made uh, wouldn't have made sense. So it's, I don't find it surprising. I think on a personal level it would have been difficult 
and we see some of that coming out in the emails from Sheikh Al Mayasa, for instance, um, because there were close personal relationships. You know, they, they went shopping in Doha. They, they were at the, the Four Seasons with their kids all the time, and so on. But um, ultimately, this is a, as a, again, pragmatic calculation of interest. And I think there's a, one final point note to, to take. As somebody who's been looking at the GCC as an organization for a long time, and was often skeptical about its impact and effectiveness, one of, the, one of the clear results of what's happened the last year or so is a kind of coming of age of the GCC. Now, this is not the only reason, but in foreign policy terms, clearly it's become a, a, an actor on the world stage. It's recognized in, on the world stage for its actions within the region. Now, in, as, as Stacey's paper was, was, in the, what was referring to, the, the role of the GCC in the, the whole Yemen process, and, and the role of the GCC in the Arab League as, as part, part of the, the process of pushing the Arab League in this uh, direction. So I think what, what, there is, what there also is, this is a supposition, it remains to be, to be proven, but that there, there's also, a, a, both of these leaderships in Doha and Riyadh um, value the added weight that the co a more coherent GCC has given them uh, collectively. Um, and I think that partly explains or that, that maybe help, helps to explain um, why Saudi Arabia has been willing to go along with certain things that they might not otherwise have gone along with, why Qatar has been willing to go along with the invasion or the invasion, with the intervention in Bahrain, for instance, and indeed why Qatar has been willing to moderate its own uh, policy preferences in Yemen vis-a-vis -vis the, the Saudi preferences because it, you know, it's now part of a, of a block that has a, appears to be fairly effective at uh, pursuing or at, at serving um, all of their interests on, in the region and, and globally. I'm not sure if that goes anywhere near answering your question, but. All right, if there are no other pressing questions, we have, yeah, there is one, I'll take it, but then after that, so we have to wrap it up. Thank you. Jeffrey King, National Endowment for Democracy. My question is for Stacy. Um, could you please clarify a little bit about the national, the upcoming National Dialogue Conference? Who is making the decisions about who will participate? Um, because it's, I can tell that we've been speaking with some of the civil society actors on the ground and the process is very opaque. And so are there, and uh, follow up, are there any opportunities to, for um, local actors to influence that process? Thank you. I, opaque would have been exactly the word that I, I would have used to describe it, um, and it, I, so I can't answer, actually, and it's upsetting to, to me personally that I can't answer. Um, I know that different groups, uh, particularly multilateral organizations, believe that they are shaping that process. Um, so that would include the Friends of Yemen, who are going to have their upcoming conference in April, um, the GCC. The United Nations has a delegation that has drawn up a very nice template. Um, ultimately, it, it's, one would assume it's up to the Yemeni government, but as you probably also know, the G10 has allocated to e its member parties jurisdiction over particular aspects of the transitional process. So I believe it's Germany that has the national dialogue, um, but I could be wrong about that because that's not the kind of stuff that gets written down so much. Um, and, um, yeah, and there was this recent conference in Potsdam about two weeks ago with ten major Yemeni figures, again, very senior leaders representing a rather ossified view of, uh, of relevant groupings within Yemen um, that convened to have their own conversation under the, that was an effort, I think, to, to shape the process um, and produced nothing in large part because seven of the ten members regularly chew together like their long-standing friends it, it didn't facilitate discussions that weren't already happening mm -hmm. right so um, you know I don't know how it's going to actually be I don't I don't actually think it'll go forward truthfully I'm pretty dubious about that because the longer this process goes on um, under these opaque conditions um, and with this pervasive sense of exclusion, I think, um, it, it's doomed. 